video series on the interaction of atoms and light to learn more about this process. What Myra shows is visual evidence of the result of these thermal pulses. The outer envelope is ejected as a fast wind, and by fast we mean the star will lose about 10 to the minus fourth solar masses per year. That's 1% of 1% of a solar mass. The Earth is about 3 times 10 to the minus sixth solar masses, so such a star will lose about 100 Earth masses of material every year. For a 5 solar mass star, it'll take somewhere between 10 and 30,000 years to slough off everything above the core. For a star like the Sun, this means that it will lose 60% of its original mass out to space in a super wind. This wind will be composed of hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, lithium, and a lot of other elements that are pretty surprising. This mass loss will happen, as we saw before, in a series of about a dozen or so puffs, where the star's radius radically increases, leading to mass loss, followed by contraction, and an even larger puffed-up radius. The last of the thermal pulses blows off what is left of the envelope over the course of a few thousand years. As the last of the envelope comes off, the hot carbon-oxygen core of our now-dead sun-like star is unveiled. As seen from the outside, the temperature goes from 4,000 Kelvin, as seen in the envelope's gases, to 120,000 Kelvin, the supremely hot laid-bare core. However, this luminosity stays constant at about 3,500 solar luminosities. This incredible temperature of the bare core means that most of its emission is in the hard ultraviolet part of the spectrum, with even some soft X-ray emission for a while. These intense and numerous ultraviolet photons ionize the ejected envelope gas, forming a planetary nebula. For the next 10,000 years, the nebula is continually ionized and heated by this hot central core, blowing it and expanding it away to the space between the stars. The interstellar medium will now be enriched and changed by this infusion of processed material. The overall hydrogen content of the interstellar medium is thus infused with new helium, carbon, and oxygen, and all the other elements that are created in that star, which were dredged up and expelled. Incidentally, they're called planetary nebulae, not because they're composed of planets or because one day their elements will go to seed future planetary disks around yet-to-be-born stars. They're so named because of the planet-like round shape of the nebulae, as observed by astronomers through early telescopes. William Herschel seems to be one of the first to coin the term in the 1780s because he thought these nebulae looked like planets. But the most definite use comes from the French astronomer Antoine d'Arquet de Palapois in January of 1779. On a cold night, he described the Ring Nebula as being very dim but perfectly outlined. It is as large as Jupiter and resembles a fading planet. Just like so many astronomerisms, we know these nebulae aren't related to planets in any direct way, but the name is stuck out of a deep respect for history and an overriding desire to lightly annoy young astronomy majors and decidedly confuse non-English-speaking astronomers. Let's now take a closer look at some of these planetary nebulae. As we zoom in around the sky, the first thing we'll look at is the Dumbbell Nebula. The Dumbbell Nebula is located in the constellation Volpecula, and it lives at a distance of about 1360 light-years. It has the honor of being the first planetary nebula to be discovered by Charles Messier in 1764, and is the 27th object in the catalog that bears his name, which contains a list of things that are not comets, as per him. It's easily visible in binoculars, and it has a visual magnitude of between 7 and 8, and it's one of the favorite for amateur astronomer star parties all over the world. I took this image using iTelescope's T18 scope using 3,000 seconds of stacked exposures in each of the RGB filters. It took only a little bit of simple processing to bring out these stunning colors. Astronomers at the National Autonomous University of Mexico computed its angular rate of expansion to be about two and a quarter arc seconds per century. This angular size expansion, combined with the known distance, gives an age for this nebula of about 14,000 years. This would be an upper limit because of the angular orientation effects, but other groups have settled on it being about 10,000 years old. And if you look closely, 
You'll see the dumbbell contains these knot-like structures. These knots vary in appearance from symmetric objects, which sometimes have tails, to others that are really irregular and tailless. Their formation and the way they move and how they track through time depend intricately on how the star blew itself apart. At the center of the nebula, you can see the bare core with about half a solar mass of material. The rest of the four or five solar masses of the star are in this nebula. And there's also a much dimmer component, here not visible, but shows up also as infrared emission. 